initially, um, I uh, what, was a graduate student uh, in linguistics. And while I was working through graduate school, I was um, running bilingual programs in New York City in some of the most impoverished communities uh, in New York. Uh, at the time, there was a large immigration of Italian immigrants from Sicily, from the island of Sicily, a large uh, influx of young people and families from Puerto Rico, Spanish speaking, and from Haiti. So those early bilingual programs I was developing and running and um, receiving money from the federal government to, to operate them. And so that's what I was doing while I was working through my way through graduate school. And I became very interested in the um, social issues surrounding these communities and the legal issues surrounding them. And at the time, women were going into law school in, in large numbers. So I thought, well, maybe I just, if I had a law degree, uh, it would make me a more effective advocate for linguistic minority populations and children. Uh, and so I thought that the law degree was going to be the icing on my educational or linguistic cake. It became ultimately more the cake. Uh, right after I completed graduate school, a uh, law school, I was offered a position at the Harvard Graduate School of Education to teach uh, a comparative language planning course, education law, higher education law, and um, education funding. So it was a rather unusual package of courses, but suited me very well. Uh, while there, I realized that I had gone over maybe to the dark side of becoming more of a lawyer. And so I returned back to Columbia University and received an LLM in constitutional law and then entered law school teaching. Uh, and so it's always been, it was in my mind for many years to return to writing about language rights. Initially, I went in different directions. You know, I wrote a book on the rights of religious minorities. I wrote a book on gender. Um, I, I wrote a larger book on equality in education. But eventually, I, and, I, and during those years, I kept watching the field of language planning and language policy develop. Uh, and at, at some point I felt, well, this is the time for me to return to being a linguist and a lawyer. Uh, and that's when I wrote the book, True American, uh, that was published in 2010. Um, and I ended that book, that was totally on the United States, except for the last chapter, which was somewhat more comparative. And I knew that, that my research in general was taking a more comparative perspective. And so I knew the next book would be comparative in some way. And I've always written on education rights or children's rights throughout my career. Uh, and so the way I came to this topic of the current book, The Rise of English, was through two legal issues that were developing simultaneously in Europe, in Italy and in France. In Italy, it was the um, Milan's Polytechnic Institution which decided to uh, change over totally to English instruction in all their graduate programs. And at that point, 100 of their faculty members were challenging them. This was in 2013, threatening to take them to court. At the same time, there was huge controversy in France over proposed legislation, uh, the Fioraso law, that was going to loosen restrictions or on the teaching in universities in languages other than English, that law was adopted. And so I started writing commentaries on those two legal cases. Uh, and I entered the world then of English as a lingua franca and all the, the political and legal controversies and social identity controversies over that. And so the initial proposal for the book that, that's coming out now, The Rise of English, was really to look at uh, Europe, what, how English was upending Europe in some way, particularly in the education system and universities and, and notions of uh, national identity and European identity as compared to the United States and the whole monolingual mindset uh, in the United States and how the United States and other Anglo countries, but particularly the US. As I started working on the book, I realized that there was much more to be had here. And I started poking around post-colonial countries, uh, which was, this was really new territory for me. I knew Europe very well. I knew the US very well. I did not know the post-colonial world. Uh, and so 
I started looking at how uh, education was, uh, how English was influencing education law and policies in select post-colonial countries uh, and the kinds of legal and political conflicts that were being created. Uh, and so uh, looking at South Africa in particular, I, I looked at India, I looked at Morocco, Rwanda, the Philippines, and I looked at South Africa. And South Africa really, uh, to me, provided very fertile terrain for exploring those kinds of questions. Um, it's, it's impossible you know, to talk about South Africa without talking, first of all, about apartheid. I'm going to start sharing my PowerPoints here. So uh, just to look at a little bit, some of you may be more familiar with the history of South Africa than others, but the, the history of South Africa really plays so clearly into controversies over language. Uh, and uh, the two aspects that I'd really like you to think about as we walk through this discussion and ultimately get to the question and answers are this idea of transformation, this idea of a constitution that was trying to, to transform society and to what extent the constitutional court in looking at these cases that, that I'm going to discuss, to what extent has the court been um, an active player or an effective player uh, in that project of transforming South African society? Uh, the other issue I'd like you to keep in mind as we, as we walk through, as we take this journey through these cases uh, is the role of Afrikaans itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis both English and, uh, and other African languages and how that, that itself, Afrikaans itself, has become such a point of contestation given the history of apartheid and the role that the Afrikaans language played in that regime of separation. Uh, and so you know, looking at the country's uh, vision of transformation and transformative justice and how it's embedded in the 1996 constitution itself really makes this uh, South Africa such an interesting site for studying these issues of, of linguistic equity, especially, especially as it relates to educational opportunity and educational access. Uh, when we think of uh, the role that education plays uh, in inculcating social values and political values and preparing citizens, it's not surprising that education has become such a persistent site of conflict uh, in a country like South Africa, you know, country, a country that's had such a troubled past and, and such a, a complicated present. So when we look at this history, we see how uh, linguistic diversity keeps bumping up against race. Uh, in a country where the racial lines themselves are blurred, uh, where uh, the, the, there's mar the marginalization itself crosses the linguistic divide, and where language has become a, a proxy and used as a proxy for race. So within that history, uh, language itself has become a flashpoint since way back since the Africana descendants of the early Dutch settlers uh, in op and, and what, what was happening there was really in opposition to British rule uh, after the anglo Boer War of 1899 to 1902, how they forged uh, an identity within the language itself, within Afrikaans. Uh, and so you know, looking at some of the dates here, significant dates here, uh, if we go back to 1910, that's when the Union of South Africa was formed. Um, and Dutch and English then were, became the two official languages. So it was, that was pre-Afrikaans. So then in 1925, the Official Languages Act of the Union Act was adopted. Uh, and that then included Afrikaans as a variant of Dutch. And it effectively made it an official language. So here we see the shift from Dutch to Afrikaans. Uh, in 1929, the, the Federation of Africana Cultural Associations was organized and their mission was to unite Africanas around this collective identity that centered on language, culture, and race. And they later used that identity 
to effectively separate and oppress non-whites. So you know, there, there's always been lasting anxieties within the white Afrikaner community over cultural survival. And within those anxieties, language has really played a major role. Uh, ultimately, uh, it gave rise to a version of white nationalism that evolved into the politics of apartheid. So in 1948, just getting through some of these significant dates here in the, in, in the evolution of this conflict over language, uh, in 1948, the Africano led National Party gained power from the British and the party then became a very dominant force. So in 1953, we see the, them adopting uh, the Bantu Education Act, which became effective, I believe in 1955. Uh, and the act itself separated children in separate schools by both race and language. And so looking back uh, at that history, it explains now why white Africanas are still wedded to educating their children in Afrikaans. It, it's changing somewhat. I mean, more and more of them are, are, are concerned about their children learning English, but there still is a large, uh, a very strong attachment to the language itself. It also explains why black South Africans are equally wedded to educating their children in English. They see English as, uh, as a post-apartheid antidote to Afrikaans. And so the black population now associates mother tongue instruction with Bantu education. It really evokes very, very uh, painful memories for them. So looking at uh, the, the, the demographics of South Africa and, and how it, it's connected to language, the population of South Africa today falls within four major racially identified groups. Uh, black Africans being 80.7%. What are considered quote unquote colors, which is a very uh, contested uh, designation itself. Uh, these are multiracial, uh, multiracial population. Uh, that's about 8.8%. Uh, Indians, Asians, 2.6% and whites, 7.8%. 9%. Uh, and again, the term colored dates back to the British Cape Colony, uh, but it acquired a, a much sharper meaning under apartheid. Uh, and again, it is highly contested, but, it, but many members of that group designate themselves in, in terms of that identity or, or it, that, that identity itself. Um, and so uh, looking at the 2011 uh, census as to how many people, what percentage of the population really has English as their first language, where you see this overwhelming support among the Black population to educate their children in English. Well, only 2.9% of that population speaks English as their first language, or what we would call their mother tongue. About 20.9% of the colored population do so. 35.9% of the white population and a very large percentage of the Indian and, uh, and other uh, Asian population. Um, but, uh, but, you, but in terms of the overall population, only about 8% of South Africans speak English at, at least during, as of the 2011 census, spoke English as their first language. Again, for the black community, English is not just a, a language of economic and social mobility, as we see people across the globe, how it's, how it's considered uh, for, for better or for worse. Uh, but for Black South Africans, uh, English is really the language of transformation, liberation, resistance. While again, Afrikaans, is the they see that as the language of oppression. Uh, but again, many white, Af white Africanists still cling to their roots uh, in Afrikaans, but so do many of the so-called colored population uh, that speaks uh, Afrikaans as their first language. And that's what makes this really difficult, that language is really crossing the racial divide here. And so uh, when we look at the current debate over language in South Africa, it largely centers around 
English versus Afrikaans. But you also have a growing movement supporting African languages uh, as well. And even some support as we're going to see from the government itself in supporting African languages. Um, the, the chapter um, in my book that uh, looks at uh, South Africa looks at three court cases that were decided by the Constitutional Court. And so the Constitutional Court itself has played some role in trying to resolve these issues over language. Uh, and, uh, and it's done so against this backdrop of transformative constitutionalism. Uh, and so I'll talk a bit about that and, and the distinction how we see the Constitutional Court evolving over time with regard to this idea of transformation and redress coming from the Constitution itself. Um, one of them, which is really a landmark decision, the Armello case, comes from elementary and secondary schooling. And I'm only going to briefly mention that and then move on to two of the cases from, from higher education. Um, and I'll discuss them in, in more detail. And so the idea of transformation, transformative constitutionalism, uh, and I was, as I was speaking to Anik before we, you all joined, um, one of the other countries that I look at in, in the forthcoming book on the rise of English is India itself. And I see parallels and maybe this could come up in the, um, in the Q and A in your comments uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, a parallel with India where these were two new democracies and, and uh, constitutions coming out of these newly formed democracies where the constitution itself built into it is this vision of creating a new society, of trying to undo the, the wrongs of the past uh, in some way. Uh, and so this idea of transformative constitutionalism, it, it refers generally to a kind of large scale social change through uh, nonviolent political processes that are grounded uh, in the law. Uh, it, it's a, a long-term kind of project of constitutional enactment uh, and interpretation and enforcement that's really committed to transforming a country's political and social institutions themselves. Uh, and so the South African constitution uh, that was adopted in 1996 is very consciously aware of this historical backdrop uh, in apartheid and, and its transformative mission uh, in creating a more just society and redressing the wrongs of the past. Uh, it's grounded in a, a liberal tradition of individual choice and, and non-discrimination, but it also contains aspects of a, a Republican nationalist tradition, recognizing some group rights. Per, for example, persons belonging to a linguistic community have the right to use their language. It's modeled on the basic uh, German basic law, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, with that, their promise of dignity, uh, equal dignity and respect. Um, and so looking at this transformative project language as it relates to education is really a key component of the project uh, itself. So when we look at the constitution, the 1996 constitution, the term transformation is not expressly stated in the text but it's found in various provisions, okay? The notion of transformation is found in various provisions. So if we look at the preamble to the constitution, uh, it expressly recognizes the inequities of the past, the importance of honoring those who suffered for justice and freedom, the role of the constitution to heal the divisions of the past, to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, fundamental human rights. Um, and so we see all this language, not the word transformation, but all this language of trying to move beyond the wrongs, uh, the wrongs of the past and to undo them. In a section called the founding provisions within the constitution, it specifically identifies um, 11 official languages, uh, including English, Afrikaans, and nine indigenous African languages, which, which it says must enjoy parity and esteem and be treated equally. Um, 
the language uh, in education provision within the constitution. And this is a key provision when we look at these court decisions where the claimants are cl really hanging their hat on the language within article 29, uh, which grants all the right to receive education in the official language or languages of their choice in public educational institutions. But then you see this, and it talks about equity, practicability, and the need to redress the results of past racially discriminatory laws and practices. Um, but you also see within there, what we, at human rights law, we would call this clawback language, uh, where th this language of, well, where it's reasonably practicable, okay? Uh, the, uh, and, and, and again, as is very common in human rights treaties, uh, it sort of mollifies what the, uh, the overall right <laughs> that's being granted uh, in the provision itself. So uh, interpreting the Bill of Rights, the Constitutional Court, and we're gonna see how, how this has worked out in these two cases, uses a kind of a flexible proportionality approach uh, that's based on um, transformative pragmatism, okay? Uh, weighing the right against the resulting benefit to society. Uh, so, you know, when, when we, we look at these court cases, we see the kind of uh, interpretive framework within which the constitutional court is operating. Uh, going beyond the constitution, the rhetoric of uh, transformation has been threaded throughout higher education policy, throughout the discourse, since the country made that transition to democracy. Uh, but it has never been, again, never been clearly defined. Uh, there were two points at which South Africa did have the opportunity to operationalize this idea of transformation, but it just, the country just fell short of the mark. The first point was back in 2004, where there was a merger of these, the 36 universities, technicons and institutes into 23 universities. Uh, and the point there, the merge, the point of the merger was to create a more racially diverse university system. The other point uh, at which South Africa had the opportunity to operationalize this idea of transformation was during, was in 2015, uh, where you had the, uh, the fees must fall student protests, which you probably read about in the news. Uh, and that led to uh, free higher education for students who fell under certain family income levels. But neither of those points led to any sustained agreement as to what to do next and what transformation uh, really meant. So that brings us to the three constitutional court decisions. The first being the Ermelo case from 2010, then the University of the Free State in 2017, and finally the Stellenbosch University deci decision in 2019. Each of these cases uh, raised questions on language rights, on mother tongue education, if not directly, at least indirectly, uh, and the role that Engl English was playing or should play in redressing past wrongs and promoting education equity and access. So first going to the Armello case. Um, this, in, in here, uh, in this case, the court ruled in favor of an Afrikaans language school uh, that refused to provide English instruction for 27 eighth grade students. And it went over two years. By the second year, it was 113 eighth grade students uh, who could not be accommodated in any of the province's English schools. These were black children and the parents were arguing that they wanted this particular school to open up English language classes for their children because the neighboring schools could not accommodate, English schools couldn't accommodate them. The court decided the case, and this is kind of interesting where we, call, we see the court at times avoiding the substance of decisions, not wanting to, um, or showing deference to the educational decision makers, but deciding these cases on procedural grounds. And so here the court decided the case on procedural grounds, 
uh, and said, well, you know, the, the procedures that were used by the Pro Provincial Department of Education were invalid, uh, that they had suspended the principal and, and they had interfered impermissibly in the governance structure of the school itself. But at the same time, the court ordered the school governing board to develop a policy that would consider the needs of other students in the community uh, and gave them a timeline within which to do it, and they did. And so that's ultimately how it was settled. But even though the court is deciding this case on procedural grounds, we see it delving into matters of substantive law that have given this, the Ermelo case, the decision, an importance that went way beyond the particular facts of the case. Uh, and so we see the court understanding that this was not just a dispute over language policy, it was something much more. And so the court engages in this very lengthy discussion of the historical backdrop, talking about radical to the radical transformation of society as a whole and of public education in particular. Uh, it highlights the quote, many scars left by apartheid uh, most importantly, the court relied on that constitutional guarantee within the, con within the Constitution itself in Article 29 that everyone has the right to receive education in the official language or languages of their choice, where, again, where it is reasonably practicable. Uh, and so the Ormello decision, even though it was, it was decided on procedural grounds and had uh, under a very narrow set of facts, it, subsequ it subsequently became the guidepost for language rights and education in South Africa. But language rights can cut in different ways as we see English, Afrikaans and African languages intersecting in the law uh, in post-apartheid South Africa. And so we see not just claims brought by black parents wanting their children to be educated in English, we see the white African-speaking Afrikan minority also claiming language rights for themselves uh, and also for others in the name of multilingualism. Uh, and so, you know, tacking on the, onto this right to education in the language of one's choice, the right to be educated for African speaking uh, children, the right to be education in Afrikaans, but extending that more, the argument more broadly under a wider tent to include all children, Africa, children who speak African languages as well under this multilingual tent. Um, and so, um, you know, we see universities then follow after the Ormello decision where the court is, is giving us this uh, framework within which it's going to decide these language conflicts under that provision within the constitution, uh, we see what happens as it migrates into the uh, university world. And universities then really do become battlegrounds for language rights. Uh, and so in it, just to back up a little bit uh, on the history of, of higher education in South Africa, in 1991, all 21 universities were organized by race and ethnicity. Uh, but as the country started inching toward democracy uh, and the universities were opening their doors to black, more black students, language policies then became a source of controversy. So um, in 1993, we see both the, the University of the Free State and Stellenbosch, and there was a third university that ended up in court, but, but the decision in, free, in the Free State uh, operated as to them as well, Pretoria, the University of Pretoria. So I'm not going to discuss that, but in any event, we see both Free State and Stellenbosch and also Pretoria introducing English as on a limited scale to accommodate these non-white students back in 1993. Uh, they later formalized this into a parallel or some form of dual language instruction as a compromise. Well, when democracy came to the country in 1994, participation rates at universities were racially disproportionate. And you'll see that here. Um, though 89% uh, of the population was black, colored or Indian, only 52% of students came from those groups. A majority of the universities were officially monolingual, 
two thirds were English medium, one quarter were Africans medium, and three were officially bilingual. Though what counted as bilingual uh, really, really varied uh, from one university uh, to another. So when we get to 2015 and 2016, we see this tension over language coming to a head. And this was in a period, a period of very intense uh, disruption on college campuses across the country. Uh, if, you've, if you saw or were watching any of the news footage during that period, it really was a period of an intense violence uh, as, as well. Uh, and so we see these campus uprisings in 2015 and 16. Uh, it began with the Twitter initiative, uh, Rhodes Must Fall, which was uh, demanding that the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, who had been prime minister of the former Cape Colony, that it be removed from the University of Cape Town campus. That evolved into a, a nationwide call of Thieves Must Fall, which grew into an Afrikaans Must Fall and open Stellenbosch movements. As the controversy heated up, uh, a YouTube video appeared. Uh, and this was of interviews of 32 black students at Stellenbosch and the video went viral. The title of it was Luis Wister, which is the African word, Afrikaans word for listen. And it was filmed by four white University of Cape Town students over six hours. What we see in that video, and the video is available on YouTube, so and I invite you to watch it. It really is quite interesting. What we see there uh, in this video, uh, they were really portraying uh, the kind of racist abuse, discrimination, marginalization, and the learning challenges uh, that Black students were experiencing in predominantly Afrikaans classes. Uh, and so what, what, we, what we see in, during this period uh, as universities really coming to embody society's failure at transformation uh, and its enduring legacy of institutional racism, racism and Eurocentrism. And so it was very clear during that period that language had become a flashpoint uh, in a society where a relatively small minority of white Afrikaners still held most of the wealth. Uh, and there were more and more demands of black students for English instruction in the universities. In response to uh, those demands, the University of the Free State uh, decided to phase out Afrikaans and move to English instruction over a five year period. Uh, and they also agreed that they would expand the tutorial program for first year students in Afrikaans and several African languages. Uh, the, the argument there was that what was happening, what existed in the parallel instruction was segregating students by race, that there were these separate classes given, uh, offered in Afrikaans and in English that effectively or inadvertently were segregating students on the basis of race. Uh, Stellenbosch University took a little bit of a different approach. Uh, they would offer dual language and simultaneous translation in the first in first year classes. Uh, and then in subsequent years, there would be simultaneous translation in dual English, a dual medium or English classes, but that depended on student needs and resources. So that commitment was 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 certainly weaker than you know than, than it, it could have been. Uh, what we see here, you know, during this period is that black students were really just becoming very impatient with what they considered this unfinished business of rooting out years of apartheid oppression. But at the same time, white African, African speakers, they also were becoming fearful of losing their language, their identity and their status. Uh, they, for the white African speakers, they still held the memory of the anglo Boer War where the enemy was not the English themselves, or not just the English, but it was the English language as well. And so looking at uh, the Free State uh, decision first from December of 2017, um, a little history on the university itself. Uh, it was founded in the early 1900s. Uh, it initially offered classes in English 
but it was the first to conduct classes in Afrikaans as well. Uh, in 2003, the university moved to a parallel language program with separate classes in English and Afrikaans. Uh, and again, that program had the unintended consequence of separating students and classes along racial lines. And so it became a source of tension, of racial tension and complaints among, among staff and students. In 2015-16, Black students pressured the administration to drop the parallel program and to offer classes in English, which uh, the, the university did. It adopted a policy in 2016, effectively eliminating Afrikaans instruction and moving over to English. The litigation itself was brought by Afriforum, which is a, a white Africana group uh, that argues on behalf of multilingualism, not just the rights of African speakers, but multilingualism in a broader sense. Um, and so again, their key argument rested on this constitutional right from Article 29 in the Constitution to be educated in the official language of, or languages of one's choice. The Chief Justice, and I want you to, I want to underscore the difference or in tone and substance when we move from the Constitutional Court's decision in the Free State case to Stellenbosch. In Free State, the Chief Justice, along with six other justices, upheld the new policy, but there were three dissenters. When we get to Stellenbosch, it's a unanimous decision upholding the, the new policy. And uh, here uh, in the Free State case, the court denied after forum, the plaintiffs, an oral hearing. Uh, on the grounds that, you know, th that the remaining questions were purely legal, there were no facts to be clarified, so there was no point for a hearing before the Constitutional Court itself. When we look at, and I, and I draw a distinction between the text of the decision and the subtext of the decision. When we look at the text of the majority opinion here in the Free State case, it focused very heavily on redress and transformation talking about the harms of racial separation the, and the implicit force of English as a unifying neutral language. Uh, it talked about the need to redress the results of white supremacy, lest it be quote unquote, kept alive and well. So that's the text. When we look at the subtext, what it was clearly about the symbolic association of Afrikaans, the language itself, with the racially motivated wrongs of apartheid and, and really settling old scores with its speakers. Uh, and so the majority just kept focusing, going through the language of the opinion, focusing heavily on redress and radical transformation with repeated references to healing, reconciliation and reparation to undo the, uh, the history of racial supremacy. It talked about the history of apartheid, the lasting legacy of social and economic inequality. It quoted from the Ermelo decision, speaking of the many scars left by apartheid, the hierarchy of privilege and advantage that certain, that certain groups had. Uh, and the, the majority states, these truths demand a quote unquote, a radical transformation of the country's formerly all Afrikaans university. Um, and the court says, the court says, well, it might be, it might be practicable, the court concedes, to retain Afrikaans as a major medium of, of instruction, but it is not reasonably practicable. Going back to that clawback language in, in, uh, in the provision within the Constitution granting education rights. Um, and so the court says it's not reasonably practical where it would lead to race relations that are quote unquote poisoned. Uh, and so the court here fears that letting that parallel program remain would, the court says, would leave the, uh, the results of white supremacy not being redressed, but kept, uh, again, kept alive and well. There were three dissenting justices. Interesting, the majority opinion was joined in by all black justices. The three dis dissenting justices were all white. And so we see Justice Froneman joined by Justice Cameron and acting Justice Pretorius presenting the harms to non-English speaking students under an English only system. 
And so they're concerned, they were really concerned about many of the uh, colored, if you will, Afrikan speaking students who no longer would have the opportunity to be educated in what was their primary language. Uh, and so they warned against disproportionately and uncritically burdening future generations with the undeniable injustices that were perpetrated by white Afrikan speakers, African speakers in the past. Uh, and they were really concerned about the majority's refusal to even give the plaintiffs of reform a hearing here to review the facts, despite the fact that this idea of reasonableness under the constitution really depended on looking at all the relevant circumstances of each particular case. But the court itself had never addressed the question, and this was this is really a novel question for the court here. It was the first time the court had ever addressed the question of sanctioning an approach that deprived speakers of one of the country's official languages, being Afrikaans, the constitutional right to receive education in the language of their choice. And the dissenter said that question had enormous implications beyond the university. Uh, I myself have some really clear thoughts on and, 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 and agree with the dissenters uh, in this case that the, the, um, that the court should have held, held a full hearing to, to see the facts rather than just dismiss it uh, and then just you know, focus on the harms uh, of the past. That it, and, and it seemed like the majority was completely disregarding the multilingual landscape uh, and the obligation under another provision of the constitution to elevate the status of indigenous languages and not simply promote English. Uh, and so the, the, the majority just com completely forgot about that other provision within the constitution. The, uh, so that was in December of 2017. In February of 2018, just a few, a few months later, um, the uh, Department of Education proposed a revised language pro policy uh, and it required univer, which was kind of interesting when you think of it in the backdrop of this court decision, it required universities to diversify their language of instruction to include indigenous official languages. Uh, and it said that each campus had to cultivate a culture of multilingualism. Yet the, the policy gave no guidance on the role of English. It ser seriously, it was just leaving it to the courts to decide that on a case by case basis. So when we look at you know, what was going on in Free State and then coming to the Stellenbosch decision to, to close it up, um, the, in Free State, the policy changes were designed to relieve racial tensions. The black students there were arguing that the separation into these parallel classes, these separate ca classes were only heightening racial tensions between black and white students. Uh, in Stellenbosch, the problem was the marginalization of black students, that black students felt they were being marginalized, but it wasn't an issue of racial tension or hostility. Uh, in Free State, the new policy effectively eliminated Afrikaans, while in the Stellenbosch case, the English, English classes would be offered throughout, but there would be Afrikaans classes in, at least in the first year and thereafter depending on need and resources. So the Stellenbosch policy was not as dramatic, if you will, or draconian uh, as the free state policy. And so you can argue then that it, it gave the court, when the court had to address it, it gave the court a, a kind of different feel about it, okay? But what we see coming out of free state into Stellenbosch, this totally new tone on the court, not going, the, you know, not talking about redressing or, or not focusing on those ideas of redress uh, and transformation. So the Stellenbosch decision was unanimous. Uh, and it was a decision written by Justice Cameron, who was one of the dissenters in the in free state, okay? And it upheld this new policy of not eliminating Afrikaans, but diminishing it. Just going back a little bit in history, Stellenbosch itself, the university, was founded in 1918 to accommodate African speaking students who had been excluded from the University of, of Cape Town. It became very quickly an elite stronghold 
of Afrikaans tradition. Uh, and it really was the academic engine for driving Africana apartheid ideology. Uh, and so that's what makes the Stellenbosch decision even more historically significant than, than you, would, you would understand. Uh, when we look again, look at the free state decision was all of the whole central theme was about redress and radical transformation. Here, the, 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 the justices only make fleeting references to the past. You know, they focus a lot on the present inequities and the whole notion of a more inclusive multilingual narrative. Uh, the whole tone and the message is very different, far more conciliatory, far more pragmatic, less politically charged. Uh, the, the court expresses concern that English dominating the curriculum could jeopardize South Africa's indigenous linguistic heritage, but the court says quite clearly that's not the university's burden. And the court and, it, and the court is essentially saying that's not our role to make to interfere in that decision. Um, and the court looks just you know, looks at the process by which Stellenbosch came to this policy, and the court again look taking a procedural route here, uh, and the court says that the policy was thorough, it was exhaustive, it was inclusive, and it was properly uh, deliberative. Uh, and, uh, and the court also con uh, concedes that judging what was reasonable and judging what was reasonable under the constitution, the university could take financial considerations into account. Uh, and so on that count, it seemed like maintaining these parallel streams in English and Afrikaans was prohibitive, and that's what the plaintiffs were arguing for, the court says, would be prohibitively expensive. Um, and so, and the court says, you know, just looking at balancing the equities here, uh, the classes, classes conducted in Afrikaans with interpreting from Afrikaans into English, that was making black students who were not conversant in Afrikaans feel marginalized, excluded, and stigmatized. On the other hand, most Afrikaans speaking students could be taught in English. They knew English sufficiently well that they could be taught um, in English. There were two concurring opinions in the Stellenbosch decision. Uh, one of them in particular is really significant. Uh, it was written by um, Justice Froneman who had dissented in the free state case. Um, and it saw in the majority opinion, a cautionary tale. Uh, Froneman says there's really a cautionary tale here with regard to the implications for multilingualism and language rights throughout schooling. Uh, and so Froneman's decision, his dissent is especially sensitive to the interests of colored African speaking students and the gaps in their educational equity. And when you look at the data, that's the population of students that are performing at the lowest uh, in terms of academic achievement. Uh, and so Froneman warns of the cost uh, in diminishing these minority languages, including Afrikaans. Uh, and he says, it's not just a loss for the plaintiffs here, but it's a loss, he says, for the world and for ourselves. Um, and so when we look at the Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch decision, in the end, it really was historic for the university uh, and South, for South Africa, that the, both the majority and concurring opinions were looking toward, were kind of forward thinking in their direction in trying to resolve these tensions among English, Afrikaans and other indigenous languages. Uh, and so they don't dismiss the wrongs of the past, they, but they really focus on present inequities within this much more inclusive multilingual narrative. Uh, you know, it's very hard to figure out what moved the court to take this more mollified approach, uh, you know, with a, a symbolic nod toward uh, multilingualism you know, were they trying to turn the corner on transformation uh, and trying to move more in step with policymakers that really is kind of open to, to question. Uh, in any event, the Minister of Higher Education hailed the Stellenbosch decision uh, and in fact used it to promote the development of African, African languages as languages of scholarship, teaching, learning, and communication. So there is this interest within the government itself to promote uh, African languages. Uh, and the, the minister interestingly said Afrikaans had to be located in a democratic South Africa and be rescued 
from a right-wing agenda. Uh, just as a, as a follow-up to the uh, to the Stellenbosch uh, decision. If we look at uh, the data uh, from 20, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, 37.7% uh, of the undergraduate students indicated that Afrikaans was their home language. So there's a large percentage there of, of young people who speak Afrikaans as their home language. But of that group, almost 50% opted to be taught in English. Uh, and 20% overall expe expressed a preference for Afrikaans instruction. So there's still some interest within, within the student population in Stellenbosch to be educated in Afrikaans, but an overwhelming interest to be educated in English. Um, before, I, I, I want to close here and, and, and welcome your questions and comments, uh, but there's just um, one, one note because the overall theme uh, of the seminar series is related to the COVID pandemic. Um, so, so relating these events to that overall theme, the Minister of Higher Education, along with there's reports that the Minister of Higher Education, along with the Minister of Basic Education, have been known now to switch into African languages, especially Isi Zulu, when addressing the public on COVID-19 matters, like the reopening of schools and delays in, in the distribution of laptops. And so what implications can we read from this? Uh, is this certainly, it's an issue of social justice, especially for people living in rural areas. Uh, is it an act on their part of decoloniality? Uh, is there some potential here for uh, Isi Zulu uh, to become a common lingua franca uh, within South Africa? Uh, so what is, or is there some importance to be read from uh, government officers now addressing the public in African languages and particularly in one African language in, in EC Zulu. Uh, and so then I, I leave you with uh, questions to, to explore uh, as to, you know, to what extent the constitutional project is really achieving its goals to reform society in, in some way. You know, what are the forces that are weighing upon the court uh, in its decisions? Uh, are they trying to, are the justices trying to turn the corner on transformation uh, and move more in step with policymakers on the language question? You know, what barriers are standing in the way of the court within their, are there their own institutional limitations that they feel and not second guessing the wisdom of academic decision makers? And finally, which I think is a really important question is like, what does African, Afrikaans represent uh, in, in society today, uh, in South Africa today? Uh, is it, does it d still denote a, a white Africana uh, racial identity that's grounded in, in apartheid nationalism and white supremacy? Or it does, signify, does it signify more of a non-ethnic linguistic uh, identity? Uh, and so I leave you with those questions and, and I invite your, your questions uh, and your comments.